Uh, Webb, being for who weaved a very tangled web. The Madam Question Speaker. Question that the House do now adjourn. The member, no, I can't remember your actual seat, Kingston. The member for Kingston Smith on indulgence. Uh, thank you, um, Speaker. And on indulgence, I'll take this opportunity to uh, record a brief valedictory uh, for the benefit of the House and, more importantly, for the record, uh, and seek the indulgence of the House to enable me to make some remarks uh, on my last day in the Parliament. Uh, it's commonplace for uh, members to stand here and to thank, as they should. Uh, officers of the parliament, uh, those that make uh, life easier for us uh, who are serving politicians, particularly ministers. But I want to begin by um, thanking the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of our nation for their forbearance, uh, because they have had to witness a, a period in their own living memory of uh, the disassociation, uh, disintegration in some cases, and then rejuvenation and renewal of their culture and their aspirations uh, in a way which has been a great test for the people who were the first peoples of this country. And it's entirely appropriate that uh, the parliament now recognises that, as we do uh, when we uh, begin uh, the session of parliament at the beginning of a parliamentary term. And it's also um, entirely appropriate that we are developing an increasingly bipartisan approach to addressing the disadvantage that still is borne very heavily uh, by the first peoples of this nation. And I certainly commend the efforts of all in the parliament, and I can, I can see the member for Banks here, and uh, I certainly want to acknowledge his distinguished record in this, in this regard. Uh, I'll also uh, quickly thank, if I can, um, family. I'm, I'm, regrettably, my family is not here at the moment, but I do want to put on the record, uh, as many other members have uh, who have reached this point, uh, how extraordinary a contribution they make to uh, all of us here. Uh, none more so in my case, as seeing as I've been in public life for in excess of 30 years, probably more like 35. Uh, and in that period of time, of course, a great deal of time has been spent away from home. Uh, so to my wife, Doris, and my children, uh, Emily, May and Grace, <laughs> big thanks. Uh, to staff as well, and again, uh, it is commonplace for us to recognise that our staff uh, are really us. There certainly are arms and legs. In my case, uh, thankfully, sometimes they're our brains as well. Um, but you, you are only able to operate effectively uh, in this place and faithfully, uh, as it were, if you have good staff. And uh, I know the member for Perth was reflecting on the longevity of his staff. I have some staff who uh, have experienced longevity uh, in my terms as well, and I do want to, to thank them personally at this point in time. Uh, in particular, Kate Pasterfield, my Deputy Chief of Staff, uh, Denise Spinks, my Chief of Staff, and in my electorate office, uh, Sandy Chick and Jenny Hunter. But there are many others here and some in the chamber uh, who I just want to say that you cannot do this job at all, and you certainly can't do this job well uh, unless you've got staff that commit themselves to you uh, and go the extra K and even more. And certainly mine have done that, and I very much appreciate their commitment and their loyalty. Uh, I made a statement uh, to explain the reason why I was um, standing down from the ministry and uh, not recontesting my seat yesterday uh, by saying that I came into this place uh, previously as a front man to become a team player. Uh, and the one thing I do want to reflect on is that if people are concerned uh, about the way in which the public views the political processes and if those of us that are participants in the process are concerned about our capacity to communicate that what we're really on about here are serious issues of public policy, then they are the things that we need to talk about and concentrate on. And I know it's been uh, a, a, a subject of considerable bemusement, including to uh, those in the press gallery, that I won't jump up on my ministerial desk and do an air guitar, uh, <laughs> you know, that, I won't, that I won't come into the House and quote my own song lyrics. Uh, you know, that I won't take the opportunities that are afforded to people who have celebrity status uh, to use that uh, to advance either the causes of the government or the political party uh, that I've come here as a member of. But there's been a very important reason for that, and it's twofold. One is I've got too much respect for what I did before uh, to belittle it in any way. <laughs> and secondly, I've got too much respect for what we're doing here and what we're trying to do to try and use that. Uh, if it can't stand on its own public policy foundations, 
then any of us uh, engaging in stunts isn't really going to help in the long term. Yeah. However, having said that, uh, I've endeavoured to do my best, uh, both in terms of loyalty, in terms of the disciplines that I think are very necessary uh, in parliamentary politics, particularly with the intensity of the cycle, the media cycle that we face. And uh, I see I'm joined by some of my, uh, my colleagues here. <laughs> I won't mention any vocal performances at this point in time. <laughs> but I think the key, I think what I'm really trying to say uh, through you, Speaker, is that um, you don't come here out of self-interest, you come here for the public interest. Uh, and in doing that, you try and make your way through uh, wherever you're sitting in the parliament, and then you hope that you can make a contribution. Now, I don't want to produce a litany uh, or, or list of any kind about contributions other than to highlight a couple of things which I think are useful to get on the record and to reflect in some ways uh, on what I discovered when I came into the parliament and when we were in opposition. The first thing I discovered was that Kim Beasley had a very loud voice, because uh, uh, we were sitting on the back bench at the time. And I actually greatly enjoyed that experience. I think all of us here um, recognise that there's, you know, the history of, of, of the modern settler nation is very much reflected through this building and all of the engagements that have gone on and the, and the characters uh, who have writ large on our stage. And so I was sitting in front of both um, Kim Beasley and Carmen Lawrence uh, and their scrutiny, their analysis, their commentary about uh, Prime Minister Howard at the time and their, and their interjection. It was a great learning experience for me. Uh, and the, the other fact is that it doesn't matter where you come from or what you've done, when you come in here you, you start from the ground up and you learn from square one as well. And uh, people just, you know, you just can't sweep in here, even if you've had some other career that's uh, had a few blooms about it, and expect that the same thing will apply. So I really wanted to learn the craft um, and apply myself to it. And of course, I brought a strong interest in the environment. And uh, one of the things that I'm pleased about is that we did have a very good um, policy when we came into uh, the 2007 election. Uh, which in part was a recognition that the way in which we've been thinking about energy and about pollution uh, and about the environment needed to change. Uh, and I'm extremely proud that we were able to argue strongly at that time for the renewable energy target and to see how well it's working now. There, there are many other things that one could talk about, uh, but of real importance there, and, and I see uh, um, Prime Minister Rudd's here, Prime Minister Gillard, former Prime Minister Gillard is here as well. Uh, what we've done on climate change will be recognised as a substantial transforming reform. And we're doing it in a way that is thorough. We're doing it in a way that is intellectually honest. We're doing it in a way that is going to reap the planet some dividends, albeit uh, too small and uh, over a long period of time than I think is necessary. But we are actually in a position to do that now. Uh, and there's a reason why business has confidence uh, in the price on carbon. It's because it's an economically rational way of dealing with this issue. And I think there's a reason why the public, I hope now, are showing increasing confidence in the price that we have on carbon, because it's working. What more could you ask for? Uh, I was fortunate enough to serve uh, in two ministries, um, education, heritage and the arts, and then uh, latterly uh, in education, early childhood and youth. Let me just say, and I want to uh, acknowledge the member for Watson here, the commitment that uh, we made in government that I felt was important for us to make, to have a system of world-class marine reserves around this nation, was a very, very important thing for us to do, and to have it realised now, albeit with some risk uh, in the other place, I think is one of the great conservation achievements uh, of this party and in the true Labor tradition. Because after all, uh, I'm happy and, to, and would always try and be generous in recognition of uh, environmental contributions across the parliament. And I think it's fair for me to say that despite much of the language that we get from uh, the Greens party in the upper house, in this forum they haven't delivered a great deal of con conservation reform. You may say, and you know, I acknowledge uh, the former Senator Brown and his activities in Tasmania, no, considerable. But here in this place, if you want to look after the environment in a real way, it is our environment as a nation, it's every Australian's environment, and you can only do it in the national parliament. And the party that has done the most of it uh, is the Labor Party, it's the Australian yeah, Labor Party. Yeah, yeah. And uh, seeing as uh, I've got the, uh, uh, the member for Rankin uh, and others here, I do recall arriving with a cassette player. Uh, at Kirribilli House, right. and uh, Prime, Prime Minister Hawke uh, greeted me wearing a pair of stubbies uh, and a shirt, and I was able to play him a track from uh, the Midnight Oil Tender One album called uh, There Must Be One Place Left in the World, uh, a song about Antarctica. Right. 
And of course, as we know, the rest is history. But in any event, um, it, that, they, that was an important commitment, and I think as well to start thinking really seriously about the powers that an environment minister has and should responsibly exercise. And I'm very pleased in all of the decisions that I made, including some controversial decisions, particularly in Queensland uh, with the Traveston Dam, that there's only one of those decisions, and then on a technicality, that was ever overturned in any court or tribunal. Uh, importantly, though, we were able to elevate uh, some of our beautiful natural places and give them the recognition and protection they deserved. I'm thinking of things like Ningaloo Reef. Uh, on the World Heritage List, and uh, what a tremendous boon to Australia and to Western Australia that will be. Uh, the listing of the Kimberley region on the National Heritage List, and of course some big and important reforms uh, to do with the Great Barrier Reef. That's really about making sure that you work in partnership with farmers on the land side of the reef, uh, so that whatever's going into the water is a lot cleaner than it's been previously. Uh, crucially, though—and this is very important for me to put this on the record. Many of those reforms are literally under threat now with the attitude that has been taken by Premier Newman and the Queensland government. There is, there is, a, there is a, a taint of recklessness and disregard for our environment that washes through that Queensland government uh, administration that frankly gives me great cause for concern. And I can assure anybody listening uh, and those of my colleagues who are here uh, that once I leave this place, uh, I'll be doing my utmost to make sure that those natural heritage, natural environment gains that have been hard won by the community and then by the parliament uh, are, are kept in place. I should go quickly now to uh, education, and I should thank the Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Gillard, uh, for giving me the opportunity to serve in that capacity. Because in some ways, uh, I was I, I was on a Let's just face it, it was a no win situation being environment minister. You know, I had 50 per cent uh, of the Australian population wanted me to do much more, and the other 50 per cent didn't want me to do anything at all. Uh, and so there we were in the middle, and, and you know, that's politics, and quite often politics is finding that middle path and arguing, <laughs> as it <were. laughs> and arguing it out as you go. And I'm proud of the legacy, uh, and I'm proud of what I've seen continue. But at the, oh, and one, one final thing to say um, a couple of other decisions that were particularly important. One was to seriously contest the question of whaling in the Southern Ocean, so-called scientific whaling. Now, it is a furphy to think that by dispatching uh, boats down there for some colour and movement TV and fundraising for a non-government organisation, you will stop the Japanese government supporting this activity. That is a complete furphy. And anyone who believes it needs to just, you know, a bit of real politic, read a bit of history. The fact is that constructive engagement and very thoughtful policy development around what we really need to do and get out of our natural environment. Whales surely are worth more to us alive than they are dead. Surely they are. And of course, uh, the research that we've been doing with our colleagues in New Zealand, uh, particularly important research about cetaceans, is showing that time and time again. They help us understand, by the way, the kind of impacts that we're seeing from a warming ocean, just as they provide sustainable income for those communities that have whale watching activities. But in any event, I digress. The next step to take uh, if one must, is to use the full force of the law and to exercise the national interest in the international forum. And the fact is that the case that's currently before uh, the International Court of Justice, it'll be the first time since I think 1972 uh, that we've actually been in a tribunal to argue that case. And just to remind those present, that was when we went to the court to protest against the French testing nuclear weapons at Muroa at all. There we are. Uh, I return to education very briefly. Um, this has been a very big and important reform for the government, and it's been a huge privilege uh, to be given carriage over those reforms. So I do want to acknowledge, uh, Julia, you giving me those responsibilities. And just think quickly about what we've done, and it's a reflection on the Federation. I mean, we've got a national curriculum for the first time. It might sound like it's a kind of a basic thing, but why did it take us until 2012 to get a national curriculum? We needed a national vision. We needed to set the standards of a curriculum as high as we could for every student, and then we needed to reach agreement with the states through the vexed processes uh, of COAG et al. to make it happen. And now we've done it. We've got the best national curriculum in the world, and you can access it by hitting enter on your computer. It is a fabulous <coughs> piece of work, and it's empowering students. It's empowering teachers Australia-wide. Uh, we also brought professional standards for teachers and principals in. Again, something really important to do. The Trades Training Centre program, which was already incepted uh, in the former term, uh, we maintained that as well. But most important of all, we responded to the first review 
into education school funding, into, um, school funding uh, in nearly 40 years, the Gonski Review, recommendations that bore down upon us and charged this parliament to, to respond, and all of us to respond. I mean, when Mr Gonski uh, and his panel, which incidentally was David Gonski be well known to many people here. I mean, he's, a, he's a, an eminent Australian, a senior business figure in the, in the Sydney business community, but also Australia-wide and regionally as well. And his panel said that education in our country shouldn't be, the quality of education shouldn't be the product of power or privilege or access to resources. I mean, that was the argument. They didn't have to write anything else. Of course, they did. And that was the thing that we needed to act on, and I'm pleased that we did. This is a fair education funding system. It's one that has equity and excellence at its heart, and it's one that, if we can set aside uh, some of the rancour and some of the partisanship that regrettably infects some of our national body politic, then it will deliver for students uh, from now and into the future. And when I say deliver, I do mean deliver, because it provides certainty and it's focused on lifting those kids that have got disadvantage and helping them learn better. And providing certainty through the funding appropriations, as everybody in this house, that's the trick. Because half of what we do here is fix up decisions that other people have made. And they may have been good decisions, they may not have been, but we've got to fix them up. And they don't last long enough. It's not good enough for the parliament to sit in here and give someone a program that lasts six or 12 months. What good is it? After nine months, they've got to go and apply for the money again. They've got to, you know, the person who is working has to sit and take retirement. We have to provide certainty, and there's nothing nothing more important that we can do than provide the certainty of our teachers and our parents that those resources will be there helping them every step of the way. You watch schools come to life when they have those resources, when principals have those sovereignty <coughs> and when they're focusing on doing the things that really count. Uh, and I was extremely pleased and proud that we were able to see the Australian Education Bill passed the parliament at about 1.10 yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll conclude now because uh, I've taken your indulgence, uh, colleagues uh, and the members in the public who are kindly listening for too long. Uh, I just want to speak about three things uh, overall. It's just a reflection from me as I've come into this place. The first is that um, I took Australian democracy so seriously that I decided to become a member for parliament and then I was privileged enough to become a minister and a cabinet minister for two terms of government. And I judge that, from my perspective, to be an incredible opportunity, but also a reflection of how important I think this place is. Yes, we do have the debates. Yes, there's lots to carry on. And frankly, there are too many people in here who spent their lives doing that and need sometimes to take a big, deep breath and set back and work out what the common interest is. And I know the member for uh, Lynn is here, and uh, uh, thanks very much, um, Rob Oakeshott, for your contributions. But I have a faith and a confidence in democracy, and it's born of the fact that we do live in a truly, truly successful, prosperous and very engaging and enlarging nation. And it's one where our opportunity is to be a positive force in our region, to really lift up what our citizens can become in the future. It's, there's, there are very few limits for us here. And I heard, uh, I heard the Prime Minister speak about that today, you know, building it on. And that's absolutely right. We've got to build it on. But in order to have that faith and confidence in democracy, we have to understand it a bit. So I'm pleased that in the national curriculum we will have civics and citizenship. It's essential that young people understand how this system works to some extent, that they don't simply get their information from grabs on telly or a bit of online or a bit of blogging or whatever it might be, because that's not really what's happening here. Uh, some serious things happen here. Sometimes we have our light-hearted moments, but ultimately, if it doesn't happen here effectively and with integrity, then the rest of the democracy around us will fall, and we can't afford to have that happen. The second thing I want to address, and uh, may surprise some of you, is I want to address our relationships in the region, but particularly with China. Uh, I consider this to be a matter of significant national importance for us as a nation. Uh, we're going through a historic sea change. We saw that sea change in the period uh, of the late 19th century into the 20th century, uh, crossed into the World War II period where we turned around and looked to the United States for some protection and security. Uh, but our region is now totally transformed. And quite often when I do forums, education forums, I get people to put up their hands and say, well, what was it like for you 50 years ago? What were the big countries? The big countries were America, the United Kingdom. And the big countries now are China and India. And of those, China, and there are others here who know this world, very important. And I view with some concern a sentiment that I've seen expressed, sometimes in the business community and sometimes further afield, 
that on the basis of our trading engagement with China, we ought to in some ways forgive what we can properly put as a national interest view and as an international view about governance, about freedom, uh, about human rights uh, and about appropriate conduct in international relations. It's an important relationship. It's one that must be conducted in a constructive fashion, and I know that it is. But it's also one where we need to be very clear about the nature of that relationship. Uh, and I think we need to think about it and talk about it a great deal. Second thing I want to talk about is sustainability. Um, there's, there's one I'm now going to um, cavil or take exception with, with one thing that I hear in here from uh, right across the parliament, uh, and that is that it's only about economic growth. Well, it's, it's not only about economic growth. I think a lot of us know that, but it's important for us to reframe what our task is here. Because if the task of the parliament, which doesn't actually have its hands on that many levers, I and mean, we're not setting interest rates here, um, probably a good thing, but uh, if the task of the parliament is to consider what Australia will be like in 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 years' time, and we can no more have these population boosters saying that we should have a population of 50 or 60 million people than we can literally frisbee ourselves to the moon until we have got sustainable planning sustainability built into our economic systems. It's not about economic growth, it's about the quality of growth. Of course employment and meaningful livelihood is absolutely essential to that, but you're ultimately not going to have meaningful livelihood unless you've got the basic provisions that the ecosystem provides for us in place as well. And that is a challenge. Uh, it's a challenge for governments, a challenge for the opposition. And I've got to say, I don't want to be rancorous myself here, but I don't hold much confidence from what I'm hearing from the Leader of the Opposition that he recognises the nature of that challenge. The next thing to say is that our future is, is born on three or four things. Um, it's not about our natural resources, even though we've got them. It's about our people resources. Well, they're the most important resource a country has. I mean, you know, let, take a quick look. Countries can have pretty much equivalent numbers of natural resources. Why do some do well and others not do so well at all? There's generally two or three answers to that. One is the education capacity of their citizens. Another one is the rigour, the robustness of their governance arrangements. Separation of powers, rule of law, respect of property rights. These things underpin successful nations. And there's one final thing that lies underneath that as well, imagination and innovation. Yeah. If you get those things in place, Australia will be an incredibly important wonderful place to live in and an important country and a successful country in the 21st century. But if we don't get those things in place, then life will be much tougher for us, for our successors uh, and for those who sit in this chamber after I've long gone. Uh, speaker, thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to put on record some of my thoughts. I didn't have too much time to prepare for this, I must confess that that may have been obvious to you. But I do want to say that I've appreciated the opportunity to serve with those of you who are my colleagues on this side of the House. Uh, I very much appreciated the support that I have from my staff who uh, are sitting uh, over there in the advisers' box that I can't even tell you. If I look across there and talk too much longer, you know what will happen. Uh, from my friends uh, and family and, and also from many in the community who have provided support to me over time as well, uh, my deep gratitude. And I wish all of you in this House well in the future. Thanks very much. The, the Prime Minister on indulgence. Um, uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, we've just heard an eloquent presentation for, from a retiring member based on his contribution to this parliament and this government in two great capacities, the environment uh, and for schools. Uh, he has been an extraordinarily successful Australian prior to coming to this place. He will be remembered for the great contribution he has made in this place, and I take to heart and am encouraged by the fact that he will hit the campaign trail to preserve our environmental achievements in Queensland once he departs this place. I wish him and his family all the best for the future. Thank you, Member. The question is the House do now adjourn. The Member for Casey has the call. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, can I pass on my best to the Member for Kingsford Smith uh, on his uh, final speech? Uh, speaker, members uh, of this House will have established local ANZAC centenary community committees. And uh, the Casey Committee was established back in. Uh, May, and I just want to take a, a moment of uh, time to uh, recognise those uh, local members of the Yarra Valley and Outer East community who have agreed to give of their time uh, on that 
uh, committee. The committee is chaired by Mr Ray Yates, uh, who is the principal of Monbulk uh, Primary, and he has strongly promoted uh, the stories of Anzac in his community, as well as contributing to numerous community organisations over many decades. Uh, also on the committee is uh, Brigadier Michael Phelps, uh, AM, recently retired, uh, senior member of the Australian Army. Uh, Mr Graham Warren, the former mayor and councillor of the Shire of Yarra Ranges. Mr Anthony McAleer, a local historian and author of a number of significant works on the contribution of local Anzacs from Mount Evelyn, from Mumbulk and from Lilydale. Uh, Ms Margie Sank, who has contributed greatly to the Rotary Club of Lilydale, uh, the Mount Evelyn Bendigo Community Bank and a number of other local causes. Uh, Mr Bob Ganaway, a prominent affiliate member and commemorations officer at the Healesville uh, RSL. Uh, Ms Sue Thompson, a former journalist, author, a historian and long-time promoter of the history of Lilydale and district. Uh, Mr Chris Thomas, a prominent local business owner and community volunteer uh, from Warburton and the Upper Yarra. Mr John Shackleton, principal at Gladysdale Primary School and a resident of Warburton. And speaker, Mr Blake Hadlow, the youngest member of the committee, a 21-year-old student from Mount Evelyn with a deep interest in the history uh, of Anzac. Blake is the grandson of the late Harry Smith of Montrose, who served Australia with, with distinction in Korea and then afterwards as a prominent member of the RSL. I want to thank each member of the committee for kindly agreeing to serve for the benefit of our local community. The question is the House to now adjourn. I call the member for Boothby. I would like to speak on the Prime Minister's failed uh, GP super clinic program. And it's a matter of record that during the 2007 federal election, uh, the current Prime Minister, the new Prime Minister and also the old Prime Minister promised 31 GP super clinics around the country. And there are now, incredibly, uh, still six GP super clinics from 2007 which are not open. There is no building, no GPs, no nurses, no nothing. And those clinics are in, uh, in Gladstone, in Mount Isa, in Redcliffe, in Townsville, in Wallen and in Wanneroo. So six clinics which were promised in 2007 are still not open. What we've seen is that of the 64 clinics that the Labor Party have promised, less than half are open. Of the 28 clinics which were announced in the, by uh, the current Prime Minister in the 2010 federal budget, um, we have only seen two open. We've seen GP super clinics which have opened with no doctors in Modbury. We've seen the Redcliffe Clinic uh, balloon out from $5 million to $13.2 million. We've seen in Norlunga a $25 million, 50-room GP super clinic opened with only two doctors and after 18 months only has two and a half uh, full-time equivalent um, G GPs. So the Prime Minister needs to explain to families around the country why we are still waiting on him to deliver on the commitments he made in 2007. The Auditor General has reported on this program and the report was damning about the administration of this program. It found that they were disproportionately weighted towards marginal electorates, something the opposition has long identified. Um, it also found that of the 36 GP super clinics announced while the current Prime Minister was Prime Minister, only three or less than 10 per cent were delivered on time. Um, I'm pleased the member for Petrie is at the desk because she went to the 2007 election and promised a GP super clinic for Redcliffe on, in October 2007. And now, almost six years later, there is no GP super clinic. The GP super clinic is not, op is not, op is not open. It was a $5 million promise. It required a bailout. It required a bailout in 2010. It required a second bailout in 2011. This has probably been, out of the 64 uh, clinics, this has been one of the worst. It's very hard to explain how a commitment that was made to the working families of 2007, whose infants from 2007 would now be six years old, they've gone through their childhood without even seeing this GP super clinic open. We've had builders walk off the site. 
We've had the government being locked out. Will you have the opportunity to respond, Member for Petrie, at the end? You have the opportunity to respond. So we have. No, you do. It's been 5 p.m. The House is adjourned. The Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Um, I uh, wish to, uh, uh, at the conclusion of the 43rd Parliament, uh, make the point that uh, we are uh, concluding uh, at 5 p.m. on the end of a parliamentary term for the first time since I've been a member of parliament. That is indicative that whatever the statements that people have made about this parliament, it has functioned effectively. And I thank all members of the, uh, the House, particularly uh, the members of the government, but also the manager of opposition business for his courtesy and the way that he has conducted himself uh, with myself uh, in managing the business of this house. I want to also uh, single out the constructive way in which the crossbenchers have played a role in this parliament. And uh, in particular, I wish uh, the uh, Speaker Jenkins, Speaker Slipper and you uh, Madam Speaker, Speaker Burke, uh, congratulations to you, all three, on the way that you have presided over uh, this chamber, and of course to uh, the uh, the clerk extraordinaire Bernard Wright, and to all involved with the functioning of this Parliament. Uh, the Parliament is now concluded, and I think it's appropriate that the Parliament conclude with a very positive message, which is that. Uh, during uh, the days ahead. Uh, I hope that uh, we have uh, more civility in Australian politics and that we bear in mind that when we return for the 44th parliament that I'm looking forward to serving in. I just want to uh, add to the remarks of the Deputy Prime Minister on behalf of myself my, and the former speakers in this parliament. Um, this place cannot function without the magnificent staff in this building and they have risen to the challenge that the hung parliament has presented to them. They have done it with amazing grace, with amazing dignity, intelligence um, and perseverance at all hours of day and night. And I think everybody in the Australian public actually owes to them a great debt of thanks. The House stands adjourned.